Good morning, and welcome to the service of worship of the First Presbyterian Church of Oneonta in this bold and sometimes scary new world of uncharted waters. We're glad you're here. As uh, some of you listening in today probably remember, I was in the middle of a sermon series for Lent about ways that we 
can draw closer to God. Uh, we had looked at we can draw closer by opening to wonder, by opening to wildness, and by opening to stillness. Today's sermon, today's little Dharma talk, was originally going to be on opening through Scripture, and next week's would be opening through intimacy, through relatedness. I was having fun with those. I might come back to them at some point, but... Uh, I think there's other things that need to be said first. So Presbyterians being big on scripture, I was looking around for text that I thought applied and could be brought to bear on what we're all going through, some of the things we're experiencing. I looked at a lot of the text that had to do around uh, what happened to Israel at the time of the Babylonian exile, some 3,000 or so years ago. When Israel was conquered, when Jerusalem was leveled, the temple was pretty much uh, destroyed. And those people, too, experienced having their reality, having the whole world, life as they were used to, and thought that it always would go on being like that, simply jerked out from underneath them. And certainly, I think for us, disorientation, dismay, uh, disbelief is something that lots of us are experiencing. This, it really is surreal. But I noticed that one of our lectionary texts for the day has uh, something to say, some deep wisdom for us, for the challenges that we're facing. A reading from the Gospel of John. We're in the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 7. As Jesus passed by, he was coming out of the temple with his disciples. He saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night comes when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And as he said, as he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, Go. Wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went, and he washed, and he came back seeing. So who sinned? His disciples asked Jesus. The sky or his parents? That he was born blind? That question has a familiar ring to me in many guises the most recent of which is, how could a loving God let COVID-19 happen? In the ancient world, there was widespread belief that if you looked at someone and they had a malady, if they had a deformity, if they had an illness, it could be put down to them having done something wrong. Or maybe the whole family, the whole lineage or tribe had done something wrong. And this was either punishment or the consequence of it. It's a belief that we haven't moved all that far on from, except now we're looking to pin it on God rather than individual people for the most part. Now Jesus, being Jesus, was able to take this question straight on. His reply is, it's not that this guy sinned, it's not that his parents sinned. And for me, I don't even understand my own life half of the time, let alone have answers with any certitude that is coming from my direct experience about things that happen well beyond our space-time continuum. But I will share with you what I believe and what I read in the Bible 
which is that God is a God of love and would never author or send something like this that strikes both good and bad, faithful and the conniving, the guilty and the innocent. That's not the kind of God that we have. Okay, you say, so why would God allow this? Again, we're way outside my pay grade here. But God allows, if we will allow ourselves to use that word and define it as not automatically or forcefully stopping something when you notice it going on, God allows a good number of things that are troubling to me in the larger sense. Uh, it's troubling to me that a man could ever hit a woman or a child, or even another person for that matter, but those are especially hurtful. Why does God allow that to happen? It's troubling to me that someone with more than enough to live on and obtain for themselves and their family all the goodies in life one could want should ever further engorge themselves at the cost of their employees or the general society. So that in our country we have the largest ratio of executive compensation to worker compensation in the world, some 250%. It's ridiculous. One other way, you would never, I hope, empty out your garbage pail into your own living room, let alone your mother's. But that's exactly what we do. We treat our mother, the earth, just like that so much of the time. Why does God allow that? So you're right, COVID-19 should not be happening. But I'll tell you something else I believe. Further on from God authoring or, or sending it, I think God suffers it, the way the old English used to say. Allows it, yes, but more so, God suffers it. So that for every one of us who has caught this terrible thing and is experiencing symptoms, or watching loved ones have to suffer through this, God is feeling that pain. God is suffering that sickness, that heartbreak, that helplessness, just as we experience it. That's what I believe. And I think it's good to keep that or something like that in mind. Because with all the things that go on in this world, in our lives or through history, in matters large and small, Most of those are down to human causes. Most of those are down to human shortcomings, failures to act, acting unwisely, allowing unsafe, unhealthy, unjust conditions to continue on. Because it's a free will world, and God doesn't just stop in and stop everything that we shouldn't be doing that we're doing. <laughs> if, he, if God did, we'd, if God did come in and stop all of those things, we'd be stopped a lot from doing many of the things that we do. But this whole free will thing that we can treat each other how we do is premised on the idea that God wants us to choose the good. God wants us to grow into the sense of oneness, of interconnectedness, of interrelatedness, with which God created this world and formed each of us. And that God's end game, God's long plan, is that we grow to maturity, that we leave this long, troubled adolescence behind, so that we are one world, sacred to God, a world at peace, a world at prayer, a world at play.
I'd like to thank Kim Patterson and Joanna Arnold for being a part of today's service, for making the technology work that they could be a part of the service. Also thanking our wonderful church choir, who, though we can't gather together at Current, uh, managed to still contribute to this service because they, back in 2002, recorded a CD of choir songs, and we were able to dust that off and make use of one of those numbers today psalm of quietness. Uh, hopefully we'll have occasion to uh, utilize some more of that. May we pray together. Be with us, O oh God, we ask you. May we feel your presence deeply. May your voice speak to us lovingly, courageously, encouragingly. May we be good friends to one another during this time, friends even to strangers, friends even to enemies. If it be thy will, Use this time, we pray, to bring us closer together as a world, to make us both more mindful of, as well as deeply appreciative of our oneness, of our interconnectedness. And that the bell, any bell that tolls, is not simply for one, but for all of us. For we are not an island, but we are a planet. Thank God that even beyond that, thank you, that we are yours. Go in peace now, good people of God, to love and serve the Lord. Use this time for your health, your renewal, some fun, some rekindling and deepening of relationships. And know that God is with you. Go in peace, good people of God. Amen.
Faith is done in realms of clearer 